Thank you for watching this pre-recorded session about creating digital content for children, young people and their families. My name is Alison Boyer and I'm the Executive Director of Kids in Museums. Every year, Kids in Museums runs an annual award for the most family-friendly museum in the UK. In 2020, because of the exceptional circumstances created by the coronavirus pandemic, we took the decision to instead give awards for some of the amazing digital content museums created for families during the long lockdown from March until the summer. I'm going to be interviewing people from four of the prize winning museums and to start off with I'm going to be talking to Danielle Cowell from National Museum Wales about their project which won the best social media category Minecraft Your Museum. Hello Danielle, could Hi. you just introduce yourself and briefly tell us about your job and the museum you work at. Yes, yeah, so um, I'm Danielle Carroll. I work at the National Roman Legion Museum. So I'm the learning manager there, um, which is a, a busy museum, but I lead for digital learning across National Museum Wales, or I'm Gather Cymru uh, in Welsh, and uh, there's seven museums across Wales. Fantastic, thank you. So, National Museum Wales won the best social media activity category for the project Minecraft Your Museum. Could you tell us a bit about what Minecraft Your Museum is? And as I'm sure not everyone watching this will be familiar with Minecraft, can you tell us a little bit about Minecraft? Yeah, of course. Um, so Minecraft Your Museum is um, a competition inviting young people to create their dream museum in Minecraft. So Minecraft is, uh, is a video game where you can build and explore and it really enhances creativity and problem solving. Um, so we put together a competition that first of all was looking at our museums and recreating what young people perhaps remembered from some of the visits, but we also had a category, just your dream museum, um, so anyone could take part. That's great. And when you started the project, were you already familiar with Minecraft or was it something you had to learn from scratch? Not familiar with Minecraft, but aware of it as a, you know, a, a video game that had lots of educational sort of values to it. Um, so uh, the Welsh Government had released some free uh, educational software, so I kind of had to play around with that. Um, I, I knew I was never going to be able to create anything wonderful in there, um, but uh, the, you know, the whole point of the competition, of course, was inviting young people to create the museum. So in a sense, I didn't, I didn't have to be good at Minecraft. I just had to understand how it worked. Um, so yeah right and were there any particular sort of advantages or disadvantages to using such a popular platform like minecraft definitely i mean um minecraft you know there's it's very popular with um primary age pupils and also adults as well lots of different age groups but it's um it's got to you know just say the word minecraft and lots of people are interested um so it was a very you know popular platform for young people to, to engage with already so working with minecraft obviously had huge advantages to you didn't have to explain to the young people what that was they they knew it inside out already museums released a lot of digital content during lockdown and obviously you were also competing against all the other digital activities children and families had to choose from how did you promote minecraft your museum and how did you make sure it reached its target audience um so the first thing i did was create um a short eye-catching film within minecraft itself um to be promoted on social media. So a really short film with subtitles that would um, give across the concept quite quickly. Um, by starting it in Minecraft, obviously it would attract anyone that ever played Minecraft or any parents 
that whose children played Minecraft. Um, so the first half of the film was all about creating your own museum. The second half was about the prize and it was lots of positive scenes um, of our museums. Um, so anyone, any regular visitors, grandparents or anyone who knew anything about museums would also be attracted to the film. Um, and then the really important part was we chatted to see to some young crafters because as I explained, I don't play it myself. Um, and we sounded out the ideas and the prize and to see if they would be interested in that. And one of the key sort of things that came out of that really was that uh, we needed to make the challenge quite open. Right. Um, and then of course it was pro promoted on social media platforms. Um, you know, we did this week in, week out for a long period of time. We worked with Welsh Government to promote it on Hub News, which is um, an education platform that all of Wales has signed up to. Uh, you know, we worked with Minecraft as well to check. Obviously, they were happy with everything. Um, and we provided like a step by step competition pack, um, which broke it down into steps because we were aware that you know young people weren't in school working on these things and there was like an email helpline for parents and teachers sort of if their child had created this wonderful minecraft thing but they didn't know how to make it into a video we could email them back and help them out with that that's great so you had that element of support for parents who might not have been so digitally literate as their children yeah definitely that's really great so it sounds like you worked really hard to promote the activity across social media. What do you know about the audience you reached? Were they people who were already engaged with National Museum Wales or did you reach some new audiences with the activity? Uh, we had a real mixture. So um, we had participants from all areas of Wales, some outside of Wales as well. Um, and they were from a real variety of kind of social economic postcodes. Um, there was a mixture of regular visitors who clearly had been to our museums lots and lots of times, knew the collections very well and recreated them fantastically. And then there were obviously others who entered who perhaps had never been to our museums. Um, but you know, knew what a museum was and how to create their dream museum. So I think we definitely got some new visitors or new engagement through this. Um, and we also noticed um, when we shared our videos and things that um, we had a much higher percentage of Welsh language speakers engaged in the project um, than we normally do. Uh, so it was really important for us to have those kind of different categories, which gave a more of an open challenge. That's great. So that sort of leads on to my next question. So some of the things that our family judges said about your activity was that they found it really engaging and interesting and that children really enjoyed thinking about what their dream museum would contain. What did you learn about what children and young people think about museums from what was created during the challenge? Was there anything that surprised you about what they put in their dream museum? Um, the first thing that really surprised me was the length to which they went to to create these museums. I was expecting maybe one gallery with a few objects and some nice labels, but no, they created entire museums, you know. Um, so they had galleries, storage, extensive collections. Some of them had really strong three themes um, and their museums were very much catered for visitors. Um, so, you know, they even thought about the menus in the restaurants, um, you know, where children would play, where parents would relax, all sorts of things. Um, and you know, the coffee shops, the toilets, it was all very practical actually. Um, so that was the surprise to me that how practical 
these museums were and actually we could learn a lot from those. Um, some had even introduced social distancing procedures well before any museums had opened and done that. And actually what they did was very similar to what we did. Um, um, and what stood out to me was that the museums that had really sort of clear concepts were the ones that were most engaging. Um, and also the presentation skills that the young people had. Um, you know, I think, although you could tell some of them perhaps weren't used to doing presentations, they, they presented so well when they were really passionate about the subject. Um, so I think, you know, what I learned was that, you know, young people definitely have a lot to offer in helping us plan future museums. And that actually may be something like Minecraft, which, although it's really great for the imagination, which is why I was drawn to it, um, it also has a really practical element to it, which yeah. um, helps them focus what they're trying to do. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. I think what you said about them thinking about the practicality of the spaces, I guess that maybe shows something about how young people value museums as kind of like social spaces or spaces to enjoy spending time with their family and want them to be comfortable and welcoming. Yeah, definitely. But yeah, no, I think that's really, I think that's really interesting. So moving on, um, you talked about what you learned from the museums. So what did you learn from the Minecraft Your Museum project overall? And what top tips would you give to anyone thinking about planning a digital project um, using Minecraft or otherwise for the sort of age group you targeted? Um, yeah, so I suppose, you know, look at, obviously, first of all, have a clear idea of what you're trying to achieve um, and then see if it can marry up with something that young people are particularly interested in. Um, but it's got to fit, you know, you can't just shove any old two things together. Um, and in this case, it was a perfect fit and a perfect time as well. Um, so yeah, think about the timing of your projects um, and how long young people have to actually invest in these, mm -hmm. in these projects. And like I said, this one was a lot of investment. So actually, you know, at another time, it might not have worked so well. Um, involve young people in the conversation and um you know don't be afraid to get involved in things you perhaps don't understand like <laughs> minecraft i don't really understand it or how it all works but um you know the young people understand it and so when we spoke to the young crafters we got some really useful little bits of information and we saw that our plan was kind of on the right direction but we needed to tweak it a bit um, obviously, you know, if you are using something, you know, like Minecraft, it has to be pretty accessible. Um, so you, working with the Welsh government at that time as well made it made it great because um, we could all, we knew then that anyone could take part. Um, also promote it through schools or any other networks that are relevant, you know, that will really help. Um, and we involved our staff as well, you know, staff who were in, excited about it for their children to share it. And then more parents would pick up the new sort of thing. Um, and then to be quite flexible as well. I think sometimes we can get quite bogged down in what our museum is about and trying to achieve and our collections and all of that. And um, actually, it doesn't always have to be specifically about our collections. It, it, our collections can inspire things in different ways. Um, and I always think it helps to have a good prize and, a, a, you know, a challenge that's pretty exciting and that young people think, oh, that, that is a real challenge um, yeah. that inspires them. And I think 
this prize, um, again, because of the timing, you know, a lot of the children, that they all said they really wanted to win for their class, which was really nice. Yeah. And that was at a time when everyone wanted to do something for the rest of the community. Um, so there's a lot of value in that, I think, as well. That's brilliant. Thank you. That's a lot of really helpful advice for anyone thinking about planning a digital project. So finally, um, as it looks like going to museums isn't going to go back totally to normal for quite some time, it's likely that people are going to be engaging digitally um, for the foreseeable future and maybe beyond if their sort of engagement habits change. Um, can you tell us anything about any future plans you have for digital engagement with this age group? Um, yeah, so what we decided to do as across Amgeth um, Cymru National Museum Wales was to invest in a virtual learning programme. So we sort of set up a pilot um, and we launched it in October. So it's kind of virtual visits um, to some of our museums. Um, so we worked initially on our most popular workshops and tried to see if they could be transferred into, um, you know, into a video format, basically into an interactive format. Yeah. Um, so they were launched in October and they've been really popular. We've had 78 sessions booked. So we've had about two and a half thousand pupils involved already. Um, and uh, so we've got, say, one on the Romans, one on the Celts, mm -hmm. uh, one about kind of Victorian washing, dinosaurs and art. Um, so what we did with these packages is uh, worked on some challenges and things around uh, resources, so lots of digital resources, um, and then um, live sessions with experts or mm -hmm. learning facilitators. Um, so it's kind of meet the Celt, meet the Roman. Um, and then, um, so we show them objects, lots of different activities. Um, so in our Roman one, we've kind of got, we get them involved in marching, which they will have already practiced and things like that. So it's kind of a nice icebreaker. And then we talk about lots of different elements of Roman life. Um, and what we found with these is that uh, we have a, a large section then just for questions and answers. Yeah. Um, and the engagement has been really good and um, actually quite different in a way to how it normally is in a museum, because when they visit the museum, you know, they're very excited, um, you know, uh, perhaps their teacher isn't right by them, like in school sort of thing. So yeah. um, we're getting a lot uh, deeper, more varied questions. So we're going to work on more sessions now. And obviously going forward into the future, then we don't really see this going away. Obviously, it won't replace coming to the museum. Um, but we can certainly offer it to schools that can't normally visit us. So in my museum in Kylie Young, which is outside Newport, we can now engage with schools in North Wales, um, whereas it was just too far a distance generally for them to come. So I think it's going to be part of our programme. And also we can look at perhaps maybe having elements during a visit. And then, you know, we could even have follow up afterwards then when children are in a, you know, they've had time to think about things um, or questions and answers. So yeah, we're really excited about that and um, feedback's gone really well as well. That sounds fantastic. So we'll look forward to hearing how that goes and how your learning and engagement changes as digital starts to play a different role. Thank you very much, Daniel, for taking the time to speak today. Thanks for giving me the opportunity. Bye. So for the second of our interviews, I'm delighted to be talking to Sarah Taylor, who works across all of Bodsey Museums. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Alison. Thanks for taking the time to speak to us. 
So first of all, could you introduce yourself, tell us briefly about your job and the museums that you work at? So I'm um, the learning officer across all of our museums at Barnsley. Um, so we have um, five and a bit sites. Um, we have um, Cannon Hall Museum, which is a stately home. Cooper Gallery, um, which is where we did WOW for. Um, Elsa Care Heritage Centre, which is the industrial um, history. Wesborough Mill, which is a 17th century working flour mill. Um, experience Barnsley, which is social history. And then we also partner with the National Trust at Wentworth Castle Gardens, which is an outdoor site. Um, and in normal times, I would be doing the holiday programme um, the under fives programme and I do um, interactives and hands on things for the permanent galleries and also the temporary shows that we have. It's quite a, a busy time, but really, really varied and lovely. Brilliant. Thank you. So the project that won our best film award at the Family Friendly Museum Award from Home was Wow Wednesdays, which was connected to the Cooper Gallery. So can you tell us a bit more about the project and the films and activities you created during lockdown? OK, so um, a little bit of back history is um, Cooper Gallery is it's a lovely little um, art gallery um, in the centre of town. Um, and a couple of years ago, we had an exhibition called Bears, which we'd had from Seven Stories which was really, really popular. And they kind of had it as a tester to see if our under fives audience was, was a, a good possibility for growing um, for the service, but on that site. Um, and it was, it was such a good exhibition. It was before I worked there, but I did go and visit it and it was really lovely. And so since then, they've kind of made a, um, a kind of commitment that we'd always have an under fives exhibition. So obviously with um, museum life, you, you take a couple of years to get into that kind of getting things written into the programme. So, so we've got it, we've got our first next under fives exhibition happening, which was um, Where's the Owl? So it was a long time coming. I started working in the January um, 2019 and I've been working towards this exhibition all that time. Um, and then um, in the autumn, 2019 we started working on our under fives program um, testing things out we've got a focus group with practitioners where we meet and we talk about um, how we can um, work with under fives families in the area and what what people need um, and then we also work with people like the libraries and other partners so in in the kind of run up to the exhibition we've um, been into foundation units in schools and made artwork um, for the exhibition and we've done outreach at libraries um, to, to meet families that didn't normally come to the gallery so we've kind of gone out to them so we're like building this kind of um, program we've started having regular um, sessions on a Friday at one of our museums for that audience um, and then we installed the exhibition on the 17th of March and then lockdown hit and we never got to open it which was quite quite sad um, but we've, we've got loads and loads of work and research um, ready so, so that we could kind of take our learning in a kind of different way. Um, That's um, great, thank you. <laughs> so building on what you were saying, it's clear that you did loads of preparation and kind of research with that audience so that the activities were really well tailored. How did you then translate all of what you've learned and we're planning for the exhibition into film. Okay, so um, one of one of the main things that we wanted to work on was stories anyway. The, the exhibition was about a story, it's um, a picture book by Tim Hopgood. Um, but a lot of the work that we've been doing with our, um, our focus group was looking at literacy levels in Barnsley, which are dropping, particularly in the kind of the the two-year-olds and then when they first start school so we we're looking at how we could encourage families to kind of share stories and feel um feel like they own the stories and that they could tell their own stories and feel confident and um, so um we developed these sessions um called story makers where you 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 came and you um 
the, the families and the, and the young children sat and they had a story performed to them in some way and then they would go away um they'd kind of join in with, with that it'd be like a kind of um, a, a story that was told and then they retold it so the children could join in and then the children then made some, a kind of prop or a puppet or something that was part of the story and then we came back again to the circle and we retold the story and sometimes we changed the ending or whatever but it's all about that kind of that the children then owned those stories and so their families and then they'd go home and then they'd tell it to their siblings or the other parents or grandparents so it's like that kind of um, taking a story and then being part of it so we really wanted to have that element as part of our, our Wow Wednesdays because we were going to have Wow Wednesdays anyway they were just going to actually be in the museum <laughs> and so it's kind of looking at different ways that we could tell stories and get children to um, be interacting with stories but in a way that their parents could be involved as well so we did do story films um, which which kind of did all sorts of stuff. We did dances. We did jigsaws with um, illustrations from Top Tim Hopgood. He kindly let us have them. And we also did craft activities because the idea was that when you had the story, you needed that craft activity as well to kind of make make something that was real that linked to the story. So it was in that kind of same ethos as our story making sessions. Um, the the things that we came down with though once we started working on this we, we kind of we tested out the um the films on on children before they went out we did a pilot um thing where every all, all the different practitioners made their own film and we tested out on children and then we made other films so that pilot stage was never actually public but it was really important for our learning so that we could see what we wanted to do um and then um and then once we started doing these stories we kind of began reading actual real stories that were published um but we we ended up in a bit of a quagmire with copyright so some of the publishers had um relaxed their rules but some that we really wanted to use wouldn't let us um share the stories for more than one live showing and it just made things really difficult um so so we persevered a bit and then we started writing our own stories <laughs> <laughs> so, and that's where we are now. <laughs> Great, that's fantastic. Thank you. So the judges who we shared your work with for the award really loved the films. They said that their children were so engaged. They asked to watch the stories multiple times. Um, Norman the Slug was a particular hit. Um, and they felt that they really stimulated their imagination. Um, Kids in Museums, we get asked a lot about how to create content for under fives. So what advice would you give to other museums thinking particularly about creating online content at the moment for this age group? Okay, so um, one of the first things is that people, not even just under fives, but all people have really short attention spans. So you, you need to make something that's quite short. Um, our golden time was about six and a half minutes and you wanted to be less than six and a half minutes, which doesn't give you very long for a story, but a story for an under five doesn't have to be that long. Um, even as an adult, if you're watching a film on your, your mobile phone for more than six and a half minutes, you, you're gonna stop listening. Um, so anyway, so we, we do short ones. Um, and there has to be something that the, the audience connect with in a personal level. So um, we quite often had um, puppets or um, characters that were, were physical characters. So you weren't just talking about a picture in a book. You, would, you had Norman was an actual male or um, um, all of that. Well, we had them um, real, real things. And then we also had um, one of one of our storytellers, Nicola, always seems goes down the um she likes to be dressed dressed up. So she kind of gets dressed up. And I think that kind of um she has this like lovely fun um persona and once she's dressed up, she, she kind of in, in, embraces the children in it. So um those are some of the tips. The other thing is that um the people that I worked with, Julia, Lisa and Nicola on the storytelling films. 
um, they completely um, care about what we were doing. They'd helped us develop those first sessions away in the museum. Um, and we'd worked really hard to, to work with families to develop them. So we, we already had quite a lot of investment anyway. Um, and they all were really authentic. So when we did our first pilot sessions um, films, um, they obviously we didn't have a film crew. We had people just had a mobile phone in their own house and none of us had made a film before. And it was, it was a little bit daunting. So we tried them and then I was working with a particular filmmaker called Andrew Quinn, who is, um, he's, he's just particularly um, sensitive and kind and listens. And so we, we were kind of unpicking what was the beauty of these pilot films that they did. And what we found was it was where their personality shone through and we were seeing their true being. So they were the people who told the stories were just being themselves and the children who already came to our sessions um recognized and we had some really nice messages of some of our, our families saying oh it was so nice to see see our friends again so it's that kind of um trying to really really um be authentic because children just they just know if you're not um i think that's really interesting because during the award, um, we watched quite a lot of online content. And that thing about the authenticity and the personality of the presenters shines through so much in the successful content. So I think that's a really great point. So you obviously put a lot of care into creating these films. So once you created them, how did you make sure they reached the target audience, the people that you wanted to see them and support during lockdown? Okay, so I, I do have a really, really comms, good comms and marketing team who are amazing. So we are so, so lucky um, and we just get each other and it just really helps. Um, so they were on board, even at the pilot stage, we, we were talking about it and they knew, they knew and I sent, um, one of them's got small children, so we tested out on her family as well. So it's that kind of um, already they were part of the, the story before we even kind of really got going. Um, we made sure that we shared it with our partners. So we've got our under five practitioners focus group that we meet. So the people who were in that group, we shared it with them so that they could share it with their networks. Um, we also have lots of people across the the Barnsley Council service that we work with. So we shared things um, that way. So, so if, if you work for a council, sometimes there's really annoying things like procurement, um, which is really difficult. And there's always these hoops to jump through. But in other ways, working for a council, you've got all these many um, departments that, that you can call upon to help. And Barnsley um, Council is really supportive. So um, we, we kind of use that and lots of different parts of the council kind of shared stuff. Um, and we also, um, the, we've also been nurturing um, lots of different partners who have um, their own kind of Facebook pages and social media and online presence themselves and shared it with them. So, um, so some of them are just um, other kind of official groups or organizations but some of them are like bloggers and vloggers and people who have um, Facebook groups who focus on under fives and stuff like that so it was about kind of we'd already been working on those connections and then we kind of carried on sharing and then people shared it on our behalf um, and the other thing that we did um, was we always have a budget for um, um, Facebook you know we promote things to certain yeah uh, you can you can target things really closely and you pay for it but we do that and it really helps so the the first films we could see that they were mostly families that we knew or people who had a link with Barnsley and we could see that it's mostly kind of mum age people were watching them um and then we could see and by the by the comments we could see that quite often they were people that we knew because that's that's kind of we recognize them we saw, saw their pictures when their profile came up um, but after sending things out further we've been we've noticed that we've now got more of a national reach 
a, a, a few people outside Britain as well, but not many, but mostly mostly in the UK. But it's really nice that we've had some people have contacted us and said that at some point they'll come to see our museum, although they're not in Barnsley. So that's really nice. And hopefully they do, because Barnsley is such a lovely place. That's great. So that's you sort of built out from your core audience and by the end you may attract some new visitors from what they see. That's really brilliant. So thinking back over the project, obviously this was not what you expected to do with this exhibition at all. Um, what do you think you've learned from the process and what top tips would you give to someone else thinking about creating digital content for under fives? Okay, so I'm, I'm not a digital kind of person. I would much prefer to use a glue stick or a bit of paint. Um, so, so actually it's, all of this has been completely out of my comfort zone. So we've had to be really brave about things and, and, and try things out. So, so I feel like work in a team where we can try things out and if things don't go well it's not terrible and we're quite supportive of each other so if you want to do something good um you need to stretch yourself I think um and if it doesn't go well it's not the end of the world um because I, I don't know so some of the things that we've tried um haven't worked so well um so, so anyway so that, that's one thing um I'm having that, that thing where I've, I've forgotten the question now. That's okay. <laughs> it feels like a job interview all of a sudden. <laughs> That's okay. Um, I can ask, I'll ask the question again. Okay. <laughs> so, obviously, the way you've ended up working with Wow Wednesdays wasn't what you planned at the start of the exhibition. Um, so, what have you kind of learned from that process and what top tips would you give someone planning a digital project for the under fives? Okay, um, to, to be kind of brave and what you do and stretch yourself and see what you can do because we're out of depth feeling sometimes. So, so try try to do things and, and try, try out things and if things go wrong, don't worry about it. Um, also, um, you need to really know your team. So one of the things that I've really enjoyed doing over the project is um, my 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 team who have worked on this project particularly have all got very different skills and obviously they're working in their own homes and I'm in my own home and for months we couldn't see each other and we had to meet on Zoom. I mean Zoom was like a whole new thing uh, <laughs> that, that first that first joint meeting that we all had and someone was there with their mobile phone like that um so so it's that kind of having um knowing knowing each other but then listening to find out what each of each of the skills were even more than you would work in in person with each other um and then really exploiting those skills um but in a, in a good way so kind of letting people kind of be brave and go their own way and kind of giving people a bit of distance to to kind of develop their ideas and then come back to things as a group. We, we did a lot of conversations where we talked about how things would develop and test things out and then came back. Um, and we, we all were really honest with each other about how things were working. Um, and I, I can't um, emphasize enough how much it was brilliant to have Quinny, who's our filmmaker, because he was the expert in that none of us were but he he's had this really lovely um relationship with with particularly um the people um who did the the stories and, and tara who did the dance all about how um looking at what they wanted to do and where they wanted to take their stories and then working out how we could do that through the magic of film Bear in mind that we're still we're still just using mobile phones because it we found that it's it's working. So they've kind of got better at sending the stuff in to Quinny and, and working in the way that he likes. But he's really supported them to kind of we started add, adding magic to things, so we can do people appearing, people shrinking and being carried away by birds, um, 
put glitter, snow. <laughs> We're filming, filming stuff for Christmas at the moment and it's not snowy um, and there's too many leaves. So we're using the magical film um, in, in all sorts of ways. So it's kind of, the, the films that we've made haven't been like the, the most glossy, they're, they're not like a, a blockbuster, but th there's something really lovely about that kind of relationship between the person who has facilitated it and the filmmaker and how they've kind of been sharing those stories together. And I think giving people the space to kind of make those relationships not, not, not be overbearing and, and question what people are doing all the time, but just be supportive has made a, a better project. That's great, thank you. And finally, obviously everyone wants to go back to visiting museums in person and running activities in person, um, but it seems at the moment that it's not going to be possible in quite the same way it was for a little while. So are you planning to carry on making digital content and sort of what are you thinking about for the future? Um, well, for our under fives, we're carrying on. So we did, um, we're working on some winter films. We've got a whole series of, of um, content called Winterville, which is going to be, it's all about magic and it's all about the winter season. So we've got um, three different stories that Lisa, Julia and Nicola are making um, and it's it's telling stories that have something to do with magic um, there's a craft activity as well that that links um, but we're, but this time we've got actual real stuff so we've made um, we're making craft packs um, in the hope that at some point on the 2nd of December the doors will open at the museum and someone will be able to go and get the craft packs um, so so like you can you, you'll be able to watch dances watch all the films and make all of the activities because all the stuff will be in one pack. Um, so although in the past for the last session we sent we sent stuff out to um, children um, from deprived areas and they, they did get packs but this is like a, a wider sharing of the craft activities so it's going to go again we're going to send some stuff out um, through children centres um, to children for Christmas. But we're also making available for families who can afford to come in and, and, and buy a craft pack that they can buy the bits and pieces and, and they can have the whole thing. So it could be something that they do over Christmas or they do it in the run up. So we're kind of starting that from the 30th of November. Um, I've had my first um, film came, came through this morning to watch, which I've not had a chance to watch because I've been too busy. Um, I've got those and then we're looking at other other ways that we can do things. So for our older children and, and a kind of wider audience, we're doing a Christmas Carol blended theatre um, show. So we've, we went and filmed just before lockdown. We had to change all, all, all the dates of when we were going to film. So we got there in time. Um, so we've been and filmed the Christmas Carol at Cannon Hall, which is one of our museums. Um, and we're going to make sensory packs and lists so that you can make your own sensory pack at home. If, if if you prefer, um, so that when um, when Scrooge is in the counting house, you have coins to touch, and when you're at the Christmas dinner at his nephew's, there's a pot of spices that you can smell. So it's that kind of trying to make things a bit more real because I, I really sometimes I have enough of digital myself, and I just want actual objects. And I think lots of people also feel like that, and I think people feel like their children are missing out because. The, the digital is so abstract and you see it and then it's gone and having that kind of physicality is is just so important for children so we're doing that and um, we're also doing a mix of kind of trails that you can either pick up online and then go to the, the, the different museums and do so they'll be like some of our we're lucky enough that some of our museums have got outside space that people can go like lovely lovely country parks and stuff um, so, so we're looking at how we can have that more kind of blended approach, um, but it's it's hard work because we, every time you come up with a plan, you have to change it because something else happens. So we're kind of getting there, and we're all still really enthusiastic. We had a slight little blip in September where where we were just tired, um, but I feel like we're kind of getting momentum again. Um, so I think 
just let yourself have flips and, and then and then feel better and carry on. That's brilliant. Thank you so much for sharing all of that, Sarah. That's some really fantastic advice. Thank you. Hello, thank you for listening to our interview so far. Today I'm talking to Tyg Crowley from the Glicksman in Cork, Republic of Ireland. Tyg, thank you for talking to us today. Um, to start with, could you briefly introduce yourself and the Glicksman to the people watching? I will, of course. Thanks so much, Alison, uh, for inviting me to speak today. Uh, it's a real honour. Uh, as it was to, to win uh, the Best International Digital Activity, we were, we were super chuffed. It was uh, a really, really great uh, acknowledgement of the work we put in and uh, a really timely boost as we entered our lockdown number two here in Ireland. Um, so thank you. Uh, so my name is Ty Crowley. I'm Senior Curator for Education and Community at the Glucksman Art Museum here in University College Cork, uh, down the south of the country in, our, in Ireland here. Uh, Cork is the second city um, and the university is quite old. So University College Cork dates back to 1845. It's, it was originally uh, Queen's uh, College Cork. Um, and the Glucksman is located on the main campus. Uh, so the Glucksman Art Museum was opened in 2004. We're a contemporary art museum, and we run a temporary, a temporary exhibition program uh, of thematic group exhibitions by Irish and international artists. Uh, and very much with our exhibition program, we collaborate quite closely with uh, colleagues across the campus, across the four schools, the colleges of campus. Uh, to bring uh, some of the research that's happening here in the university to a wider general public. Um, and uh, I suppose my role uh, more specifically here uh, in the museum is around our education and community based programs. And uh, we offer quite a wide range of activities for audiences of all ages. So from the very youngest uh, members of our society right through to the oldest and everyone in between. Um, and so depending on the day of the week, our audience, our focus on audiences can shift quite a lot. So uh, during the week, we might have a strong focus on schools or on students, uh, the third level students here on campus. And then at weekends, we might have much more of a family focus uh, and, and the activities uh, from talks, workshop courses will reflect those shifts in, in, in the type of audience we're, we're looking to engage. That's brilliant. Um, Thank just, you. Just, Sorry. Just, Ooh, carry on. No, carry on. Yeah, just Sorry. to say a little bit, I suppose, uh, our community program, which we're very proud of as well, uh, we seek to, I suppose, invite people across the whole of our community to, to come and to engage in creative activities in the museum. Uh, now, we're located just at kind of the entrance of University College Cork, so uh, we're kind of a point of a lot of people entering the university for the first time. So through our schools program, uh, a lot of people would come into the university through uh, the activities we offer. Uh, and we're reaching out to communities may not have that history of third level education. Uh, and so that's quite important as well. But we do a lot of work with young asylum seekers, with uh, traveler community, with disadvantaged youths, but also with um, communities of interest uh, and communities who may have an expertise in a certain area to, to really run a quite a diverse program uh, um, that allows artists and communities to pair and, and to, and to uh, deliver exciting projects. So that's just a little bit about what we do. <laughs> that's fantastic. It sounds amazing, the diversity of the groups that you work with um, and the link between sort of your community and the university. That's really, that's kind of really interesting that you kind of bridge that gap. So for the Family Friendly Museum Award from Home, um, you won the best international digital activity category for creative creativity at home. Can you tell us a bit about that project? Yeah, so I suppose when when we entered lockdown here in Ireland, um, which was around mid March, uh, and the museum closed down, we were thinking very much about which audience really needed uh, some sort of uh, 
attention, I suppose. Which audience were, were we going to focus on uh, immediately? Uh, and so that adult audience that we usually engage with, our third level students, were very much preoccupied with the unprecedented events that were unfolding. You know, we were all glued to our phones, the rolling news and so on. So we were thinking about actually our family audiences. Um, and I have young kids at home, so maybe it was very immediate for me. When schools were out and that pressure on parents to actually, how do you keep them somewhat removed from what was happening globally, but also keeping them entertained and keeping them focused. So we felt that creative activities for families were really a great way to, for the museum to, uh, to continue to engage with people uh, and to offer something that's really worthwhile. So our creativity at home activities are, co are a combination of video tutorials uh, and PDFs which with instructions and questions and challenges. So very, uh, very much from the outset, we were thinking about keeping our activities quite simple. So we didn't want to add to the stress and the burden of parents as they were trying to deal with nothing too challenging, but rather to kind of allow them and it, children of all ages to have a bit of fun together as a family unit at the kitchen table with very simple activities uh, and to, to make art together. Uh, and that ethos stems a lot from our, from our family program that we ran for the last 10 years. Uh, and we, we run a family uh, workshop, a free family workshop every Sunday called Family Sundays, that would really was about uh, families coming into the museum and engaging in these simple activities together. So it kind of stemmed from that, that idea. And we wanted to bring that online uh, and into people's homes at a time that they really needed it. That's great. Um, so when back in March, Kids and Museums, we were kind of watching the museum sector to see what was going to happen, see how um, museums and galleries were going to react to lockdown. And you guys at the Glicksman, you were one of the first places to put family activities up online. Um, so I guess my question is about how did you kind of adapt so quickly and it seems like you were very easily and flexibly able to respond to the change in circumstances which obviously for most people happened almost overnight yeah maybe from the outside it might have seemed seamless but for <laughs> it, maybe from inside not so much but um i think once we identified our audience that was kind of key so we, we knew then we strongly what we were looking at were an age group of children that were primary age uh, national school level and their parents and supporting them to make together. So that was, I think, key was to identify that audience. And then we had, like I said, years of experience of working on these workshops where we were in, enabling families to be creative together without too much facilitation so that they really are in, in, uh, working together as a, as a family unit uh, on, on, on uh, activities. And so drawing on those, uh, that experience and the, the, the different activities that we offered on a weekly basis, we had a kind of a catalog of things we could go back to. And then uh, I suppose it was the creativity of our small team then, uh, and, and particularly Lucia Taugru who made those uh, beautiful videos, it, but it was about not overstretching ourselves. So not thinking about, not trying to be too jazzy with the technology because we were new to it as well. We were coming from a space where we, did some work online, but not we were, we were certainly not experts. So we were trying to keep things simple for ourselves so that we weren't overstretching ourselves and then providing activities that were meaningful to people. Uh, and for, as we developed the activities, they, they evolved and changed as we realized that we were running out of art materials ourselves. Uh, and, <laughs> uh, and if we were running out of art materials, then surely families at home were, were as well. So we were adapting the activities and responding to what was happening. But I suppose the fact that we had this huge kind of back catalog, so to speak, of activities that we'd run previously, we were able to easily roll them out. So I think, yeah. That's fantastic. So it sounds like you were sort of playing to your strengths and um, the digital part of it was sort of almost sort of quite simple and straightforward on top of what you already knew how to do really well. So you weren't reinventing the wheel. Yeah, and I suppose, I mean, key, those key, key things that we kept in mind was the simplicity of activities 
offering families, parents, that kind of opportunity to be creative without having to think them too much about what they need to do or, you know, um, but also the flexibility in the activities. So if it was a kid who was five or a kid who was 10, uh, they could both participate at the same time. So we're going to almost in, in our mind, we were, could see the older kid working with the younger kid at the kitchen table. And, uh, and again, so there is, there was enjoyment across the activity. So it wasn't a specific age group, but rather more kind of open, flexible activities that we were interested in. And I think that certainly came across in the feedback we received from families. Um, one of the things they commented on were both how engaging the activities were, um, even though they appeared to be quite simple, but also how accessible they were. And they were able to engage with the whole family and sort of children who had um, special educational needs, things like that. So that was something that really impressed our judges. Yeah, and and even we even had um, third level students here and were picking up some of the activities and running with them themselves. So like it was a case that, you know, um, some of our audiences that we didn't expect to be addressing actually found enjoyment in the activities as well. Um, and I suppose important to say that, I mean, we have had very strong schools program and a lot of the teachers and educators that we work with were picking up on these and using them with their students as well as a really kind of useful tool. Because of course, when schools had to move online at the same time, they didn't have that support, the resources in place. So anything like this were really useful. So we did see the activity being used uh, in classrooms or not in classrooms, but in, in virtual classrooms, so to speak, as well, which was really nice, you know. That's great. So obviously, once sort of people got into their stride in lockdown, there was an awful lot of digital content being produced for families, not just by museums, but there was kind of, certainly in the UK, there was JWIX doing PE, there were kitchen discos, there were all sorts of things. So how did you make sure your activities stood out and got to the audiences you wanted to reach? Yeah, so I suppose, like, to be honest, I think the, the fact that we were quick out of the blocks was certainly helpful because um, within a handful of days, we had activities online and, and were offering them to families. And while everyone was playing catch up, we were a little bit ahead. And I think that if you can kind of take ownership of that space quite quickly, then, it, it, then it's useful. Um, but certainly it was the, the, the promotion and, and engaging audiences. Our initial audiences were the audience we generally have in the museum. So our local audiences of families who would we'd be very connected to. Um, and as they picked up and shared on social media, to be fair, is the, the main way we share our activities. Um, when those families began to share, we saw new audiences engage with us. Um, and then it was hugely supported by kids and museums as, as you shared it, uh, uh, you know, in those uh, earlier periods of March and April. And then RT, uh, which is the, um, the national broadcaster here in Ireland, uh, were running a homeschool and they picked up on it and began sharing the activities. So um, as they were releasing the activities, we were trying to create new ones so they could release more. But that allowed us then to reach again an audience that we, I mean, we work, we work to be in an international museum, uh, but very much with our education program, we had been working in, in a regional context. So that allowed us to become much more of a national, uh, to think nationally. Uh, and beyond that, uh, a little later in, in, the, in the spring, BBC picked up on the activity and shared it on their website. And then we saw engagement in an international way. So we were seeing uh, people from Australia or from Singapore on our website, downloading the activities and accessing the, the videos. So that, that was a brilliant way to see how digital is, you know, we hadn't thought about it previous probably, but how we dig, those digital um, online activities and, uh, and uh, programs can really allow you to, to engage audiences you wouldn't have done in the past. Um, in the main, we use social media, Twitter and Facebook and Instagram to promote and to share activities. Um, and those, those audiences are really useful in terms of spreading the word. Uh, and I think because we were able to keep the momentum of the activities on a daily basis, uh, 
that momentum was kept up and probably allowed us uh, that space where we were acknowledged, particularly during that spring for the work we were doing. Yeah. That's great. So it sounds like you found a big, quite a big new digital audience during the sort of past six to nine months. And um, it's probably too early to tell whether that sort of what will happen to that audience long term in terms of whether you will they will translate into sort of visitors or repeat visitors to your website or anything. Yeah, I mean, it, it's I think there is a lot of learn. I think like everything, our practice is going to change somewhat now uh, due to COVID and due to, I suppose, we have developed all of these skills now in terms of being able to provide digital content. I think it's something that we will keep part of our program going forward. Um, and so whether it is the fact that actually we will have local or national audiences visiting us on site, but we may still keep an audience who actually never visit us. So that's kind of interesting to think about the different audiences that may come beyond COVID, uh, where we're actually got an audience who never make it into the museum, but will only know us as this online uh, um, art, uh, art museum uh, as such. So I, th I think it'll be interesting to see how that develops. Um, we've definitely, I mean, I think We've generated a lot of interest to the activities we've, we've put on. And so you'd be hopeful that uh, we will see, we'll see those people uh, attend our on-site activities um, in 2021, maybe. Fingers, yeah. fingers crossed we can all run on-site activities again in 2021. So you mentioned earlier that you were quite new to creating digital content in your small team when this all started. So obviously, it's been a new thing for everyone and people are still learning. So what top tips do you think you'd give a sort of relatively small team starting out trying to make digital content for the first time? I guess, I mean, I will probably repeat myself a little bit here, but um, certainly I suppose understanding your audience. So regardless of who that audience is, kind of responding and be clear about that audience and knowing what that audience needs and wants. So um, I think that's what made Creative D at home so uh, popular uh, and so uh, effective was because we knew exactly what that audience needed and wanted, probably because we were that audience ourselves in, in a way. Um, but I think that is very important. So whether regardless of who that audience is, knowing, knowing really what they need and want. Um, and then I suppose it was kind of important that we didn't overstretch. And I would say that to most or not, not particularly around the technical aspects so that we keeping things nice and simple and not putting too much additional pressure on yourself to try and produce um, a a film or something that isn't within your capacity. Uh, and as we started quite simply recording these films on our on phones um, and using a stop motion style of effect. But since that early time, now we have developed a lot of skills. So like we probably now could attempt something a bit more um, ambitious. But at that time, I think it's important we were responding to the skill set that we had and not, not going beyond it. So I think those are probably two things that I would I would like to highlight, I suppose, understanding an audience and then not overstretching. Um, and also, I suppose, important to look at your own history of what you've delivered as a museum and, and go, actually, what can we draw upon? Rather than, I think it was very important for us, particularly in that early period of the spring as well, that we weren't trying to reinvent the wheel. We were actually drawing on our own experiences and, 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 and the work that we had done for many years, you know. That's great, thank you. And I guess finally, I mean, the last nine months I think has changed everyone's lives. It's changed the world in so many ways, and museums definitely aren't exempt for that. So, how do you see your work changing in the future? Do you have any sort of future plans that are now different because of COVID? Um, and I, again, I've, I've touched a little bit on this, I suppose, in terms of our thinking about our audiences, but I suppose even just beyond the families, uh, our artist talk program, we've seen a huge change in terms of the numbers of people who are attending these online talks. And, and you probably notice yourself through webinars and stuff that you'd offer. Actually, the number of participants is, is huge now. And that is because people don't have to travel to the venue. They can 
tune in quite easily. So I think that's definitely going to be a change, whether we will do on-site talks, but still deliver it as an online offer, um, I think is, is certainly something I would imagine will take up. In terms of families, um, like for younger people, um, uh, there has been a real interest in, the, in these online courses that we've been offering, uh, um, and they've we've, we've had huge success with those. So the, again, I suppose an ease for for parents or guardians that they can just pop on the iPad and allow the kid uh, to engage with someone without the drama of having to drive somewhere, or try to 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 get to a certain location and then wait around actually much easier uh, and we've say, seen huge interest in, in our uh, online courses and classes so i would imagine part of that will be will be kept i guess trying to um, get, look into the future and try to guess is, is certainly a, um, something that uh, I've been trying to do all year and to, with no success so I'm not sure if this will be true but I would imagine elements of this will be kept as we move forward uh, in terms of programming um, and of course our creativity at home activities we are we're still working on them and we will continue to work on them. Um, and like I said, they've been really useful for educators. So I think there, those people who have used, like there must be over 30 we have developed now, but to be able to kind of top them up and provide people with new activities to try every now and again. Uh, so we did ones for Halloween and we're gonna do some for Christmas now as well. So people can easily um, use those resources, which I think, you know, beyond this year will be useful for schools and, and, and for families. Definitely. Thank you very much for talking to us today. It's been really interesting to hear about the work you've been doing during lockdown. Thanks so much, Alison. Thanks again for all your support, uh, Kids and Museum support. It's been absolutely fantastic and we're thrilled to be uh, to the winners of that, the International Best Digital uh, Award. It, it's, it's a fantastic achievement and we're, we're thrilled. Thank you. Thanks very much. So for the final interview with our award winners, I'm talking to Leah Dungay from the National Computer Game Museum. Hi, Leah. Hello. Um, first of all, can you just introduce yourself? Tell us briefly about the museum and the job you do there. Yeah, so my name is Leah. I'm currently the learning officer for the National Video Game Muse Museum and we're in Sheffield. Uh, we opened in 2018 and before that we were based in Nottingham as the National Video Game Arcade. Um, so we are currently the UK's National Culture a Cultural Centre for Video Games. Uh, so we explore and teach audiences about how games are made, who makes them and why they are made as well, as well as teaching the sort of history of games. That's great, thank you. So the National Video Game Museum won the best website activity category at the Kids in Museums Family Friendly Museum Award from Home this year. And your project was called Create Your Own Pixel Art Character. Mm -hmm. So can you just tell us a little bit about the project and in particular, how you managed to build something that families found so engaging and creative? Well, thank you. Um... Yeah, still very excited. Um, but so just before just before we closed in March, um, we ran um, an activity, a drop in activity at the museum using a program called Fiscal, um, which you could use to create a video game character. So we had visitors making their own characters and then we would upload them into a game that they could play on the galleries. Uh, so we we found the activity to be really really popular with young people and they kept coming coming back to make another one um but also grown-ups really clicked with it as well and they were having a go so it was quite nice, nice to see sort of all members of the family engage um and we found that the ability for young people to create a video game character that looked like something from a real game and then to see it in a game that was really ex exciting for them um so we had lots of families make note of the program that we were using because it was sort of freely available to use at home as well um, so it seemed to inspire a lot of people to go home and keep making after their visit um, so while the initial activity was kind of simple enough to do as a drop-in activity on the galleries we knew that there were lots of opportunities for those who engage with it to sort of keep learning and keep developing creative skills 
after their visit. Um, so I wanted to base the first activity, having sort of just run it, and it being fresh in my mind, base the first activity on that. Um, so I de developed a live streamed uh, workshop where I took people through the process of making their characters. Uh, so that's that was live streamed on our YouTube channel and then was recorded uh, for anyone to, to go and watch later on. Um, and then it, we had digital resources that released alongside that, that people could follow along with the video. So it made it a little bit easier. Um, so we knew, obviously we know how important video games are and like looking back at it now, we knew how important video games have been for so many families over lockdown, especially. So I, I wanted to harness that enthusiasm uh, for games, but also emphasize the fact that anyone can play and make games at home. And there's lots of easy and accessible ways to do that and tools that already exist that you can use from your home computer. That's brilliant, thank you. And because some of the people listening might not be so familiar, can you just tell us a bit more about what PIP, I've got to get this right, PIP <laughs> is and how it works? Mm -hmm. yeah, it's tricky to say. Um, yeah, so uh, Piskel, or Piskel app, as it's sometimes called as well, uh, it's like a free browser based online sprite creator and editor. So you can use it to make like animated images so you can make your own video game characters that are animated um so in our activity we use it to make video game characters um so it's it's a game making tool or it's a sort of part of a game making tool set um but it's incredibly simple to use so you don't need to have any kind of prior knowledge before using it and you you don't need to have any sort of particular coding skills um and like it reminded a lot of parents of things like microsoft paint it felt like a very similar setup. So actually, once you had some instruction, it was quite intuitive to use. You might need to figure out what some of the buttons did. But other than that, you can kind of just start going. Um, so you can make something very simple or you can make something incredibly detailed in it as well and make hundreds of frames of animation. So that's very exciting. There's lots of ways to sort of keep developing and getting better. Um, and then you can download what you've made as like an image just to sort of share. You can also download them as animated GIFs. So you could send in, you know, Facebook chats and things like that if you wanted to. Um, but you can also download them as things called a sprite sheet, which you can use to put into games in other kind of uh, platforms that like you can add a character that you make in Pisco into something like Scratch. So there's lots of ways to keep developing. That's great. That sounds very exciting. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so in addition to saying your um, activity was really engaging and creative, something else families fed back upon was the guidance that you provided for parents that went with the activity. Um, a lot of families commented that they wouldn't have felt confident to do a game making activity with their mm -hmm. children without this guidance. So can you talk a bit about how you pulled that guidance together and what you did to help parents feel confident supporting their children to get involved. Mm -hmm. that, that's really important to us because it can feel like such a complicated thing to start doing. And it can be, it can be really complicated, but there's lots of more accessible ways to sort of get involved, to get started. And uh, this programme that we use for this activity is definitely one of those ways. So I wanted to emphasise how simple it was to use um, so hopefully the the kind of uh, pdf the digital uh, instructions sort of made that clear i wanted to make them as clear as possible so that young people could sort of pick them up and do them but also parents would understand them as well um, and it was important to do the live stream tutorial and have kind of a, a video uh, tutorial alongside that just so people could you know watch it live, they could ask questions, uh, but they could also go back and watch it and, you know, pick out certain clips if they wanted to see how it worked. Um, so that felt really important into sort of building confidence. We had some questions pop up on social media, so we were keeping an eye on that after the live stream as well. So we were able to answer questions that came there. Um, so that was really positive. We, we found that there was nothing that was too complicated that we couldn't solve. Sometimes it was just the wrong button or like they missed something. So it was good to be able to help out in that way as well. Um, but we, we we found that like our, our family's audience has been split between like the, the parents who love games themselves and they want to 
show their children all the games that they want to make so they want to get involved that way um, but there's also the parents that see their young people loving games and being really enthusiastic about games and want to share in that interest so I wanted to make sure that parents could feel involved and felt confident to do that as well because it, it can be so tricky because young people are so so good at these things sort of naturally it seems but everyone can get involved. Well, that's great and I think that's something that our family judges had back that it was an activity that the whole family could do which was something that they really liked about it. Oh, great. So during lockdown obviously there was a lot of digital content for families both from museums and sort of from the world at large so how did you promote this activity and make sure it reached the audience you wanted it to reach? Yeah so we did it in a few different ways. Um, so we had like an existing sort of families mailing list from something called Pixel Heads, which was like a, a family club that we run. Uh, we ran for video games, um, both in Nottingham in our previous location, in Sheffield as well. Um, so that's a list of sort of engaged families that want to see what we're doing. So we obviously reached out to them because it was the sort of perfect audience for this kind of thing. Um, and a social media activity as well. We got involved really early on after we closed so um, we released a list of a huge list of educational games that are actually fun was the title of the list so there were some games that we'd re recommended that um, young people could play but also learn something at the same time which was probably helpful for homeschooling if people were suddenly found that they needed to occupy several children um, so that was shared really widely and we had lots of recommendations for that so that helped grow our family audience as well um so we we also knew that lots of young people at this time and sort of generally are engaging with video game based content online especially in youtube things like that they're already watching a lot of that kind of stuff so we knew that if we could reach those audiences as well still engage their enthusiasm for games but also teach them something um like that was the kind of perfect audience range and so that's why we use like platforms like YouTube so we could do that. Hey, and what do you know about the audience you reached? Are they people you were already engaged with or did you uh, did you reach a wider audience as well? And it might be too early to tell do you think you're getting some new museum visitors out of this? Yeah it's funny you say that I think we, we might have done. Um, so lots of lots of the families that engaged were already in, were already engaged with what we were doing and were enthusiastic supporters especially those that came through things like social media channels um but then a lot of the content that we were making very early on was being shared sort of in platforms that we might not have been shared with before like like kids in museums so we were, we were on the kids in museum list um we had activities shared in like our local newspapers as well in the sheffield star uh so it definitely has helped to widen our reach and widen our audience um, so we continue to do the live streams uh, the MBM at home ones and then we ran like a virtual pixel heads summer club over the summer so we kept growing that family audiences and they kept growing coming back uh, when we reopened after the summer we did have a few of the pixel heads club families eventually come to the museum and they were telling us every week oh we can't wait to come so I, I think it has helped it, it definitely is widened our audience and some have started to come back as well obviously before we closed again <laughs> yeah <laughs> so hopefully in the longer term those audiences will keep coming back to you that's mm -hmm. really that's really nice so what did you think you learned from sort of this project and what tips would you give to another museum planning a sort of digitally based project for children and young people mm -hmm. There is a lot to consider um, is one thing I think we've, we've learned. It sounds kind of simple enough to take something you've done in already and put it online, but there's there's so many steps to work out. Um, so where we were going to put the live streams, for example, was a, was a big one um, because there's lots of different platforms um, and they've all got different merits. Uh, we, we ended up choosing YouTube because we felt it would be the most familiar to our family audiences and to the young people in general. 
um, but it is an open platform. So that means if you're live streaming, anyone can engage with it. Um, so you have to consider safety and moderation and things like that. So we had a moderator for all of the live streams to make sure that the comments were all civil and kind and nobody was sharing sensitive information, um, things like that. We also encouraged um, family to watch the live streams together. Um, so we sent out sort of safety tips on our mailing list uh, to all the people who were getting involved just to be like make sure that if your child is commenting along that you, you know what they're saying and like we'll be looking after them as well. Uh, we also used a bot to, to keep an eye on the comments so you can use like this free uh, like robots essentially that look after the comments so you can ban any kind of words immediately so they won't even appear um so that was a, that's a huge consideration safety how you're looking after people getting involved especially if they're young people vulnerable people um so that that's a huge consideration um streaming in general as well is quite a difficult thing to do and it requires maybe a, a complicated setup so we used uh, something called OBS, which is a streaming management software, which is free and it's open source. Uh, it's really good, but it helps you look after what you're putting on the screen and what you can see and what they can see and means you could like personalize it. Um, but it all took a lot of work. So yeah, consider that <laughs> when you were when you're working. We had to, we had um, myself and our marketing person uh, who was helping me put everything together and we were kind of dedicated to doing it for a short while. So it did take a lot of time and there were lots of different things to work out. Um, and I think the, la the last thing would be accessibility. So we're, we're a video game museum. So lots of what we do is technical based and obviously now everyone's sort of engaging with a, a digital means. So it means that a lot of people who can't access those things are blocked from accessing your content. So it's something I, st I want to keep looking at because I don't think we did it enough, but to look for different ways of engagement. So if you have a digital activity, are there ways that you could engage somehow offline as well? Um, so yeah, accessibility and safety, I think. That's great, thank you. So finally, it looks like this period of lockdown has probably changed how everyone engages with culture and heritage and going forward there's likely to be a lot more digital engagement than there was pre-pandemic and mm -hmm. um, so do you have future plans for more digital work yes uh hopefully um so after the mvm at home sort of series that we ran which the pixar one was one of them we ran the summer club um uh, so that format was really great we felt it sort of built a community of families who kept coming back and you know we got to take suggestions for future activities and incorporate that in as well and and we sort of got to really know our audience uh, so we hope to bring that into the museum um, when we reopened um, but considering more lockdowns I think that it's going to return virtually again maybe next summer may, maybe sort of shorter term things um, but we're, we're massively constrained by capacity. Uh, so I'm the current, currently the only member of the learning team. So there's, there's like a, it's a huge limit to what I can fit into one day. Um, but we are developing some stuff for our social media, some sort of short, shorter form things I think we're missing at the moment. Um, and live streams will be back. Uh, and hopefully it will include workshops for schools as well as families. Uh, so yeah, we're, we're definitely not putting the remote learning or digital engagement away uh, for some time, I think. Um, but yeah, we're, we're working on our plans at the minute. Thank you, Leah, and thank you for taking the time to talk to us today. I found that really interesting. Great, thank you.